From October to December 2021, UTS engaged in a university consultation on the ethical implications of using educational technology powered by analytics or artificial intelligence. We dubbed this EdTech Ethics. Using the principles and methods of deliberative democracy, an open invitation to students, tutors, and academics led to the creation of a 20-strong deliberative mini-public, or DMP. This diverse group committed to learning about the topic, critical thinking, respectful deliberation, and the drafting of a set of ethical principles. The briefing for the DMP was, what principles should govern UTS use of analytics and artificial intelligence to improve teaching and learning for all, while minimizing the possibility of harmful outcomes? This is the closing presentation by the DMP to senior leaders, entrusting these principles to UTS governance processes to guide the future use of analytics and AI-powered edtech. Three senior leaders attended this final session, the Chief Data Officer, the Head of Corporate Information, and the Director of the Center for Social Justice and Inclusion. And four members of the mini public were elected by their peers two staff and two students, to summarize the work. This is the fifth and final session of the UTS, working on with 20 students and academics on a question of what principles should govern UTS's use of analytics and artificial intelligence to improve teaching and learning for all, while minimizing the possibilities of harmful outcomes. We've got three guests here today, Verity Firth, Craig Napier, and Deborah Murray. They're gonna introduce themselves and then four of the group are gonna present their work and there'll be a discussion. Uh, we're gonna start with you, Craig. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Chad. And look, thanks all uh, for the invitation. Um, I think my role here at UTS is as Chief Data Officer. So very interested in the work that you have all been doing. And it's, um, it's really enlightening to read and see some of the, the great progress you've made. So, you know, I think one of the things um, that encouraged me to come along and to be involved in this is we do need to ensure that we can be open and transparent in the way in which we use data. So to have a group like this do, uh, a lot of the work in establishing principles is extremely uh, encouraging for me. So I, I'm probably saying thank you um, and excited to see some of the work that you've been doing. Thank you. Deborah. Yes, hi. Um, my role is Head of Corporate Information, but what that really means in reality um, is I'm coming in from a privacy, a records management and an access to information perspective, say for freedom of information. So all of them have some sort of element to lean towards how we use data in this space. Obviously privacy um, more than any, but the others do too have some um, um, reference here as well. So I'm, I'm looking at it from that perspective. And I was very pleased to see that a lot of the um, considerations have been included in the document I've read so far. So um, I think we're heading in the right direction, but I'm interested to see what comes out of today. Lovely. And Verity. Hello, I'm Verity Firth. I'm the Executive Director of Social Justice here at UTS and I run our Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion. And I'm very happy to be here because um, for those I met last time, it's I think this is a wonderful project that you're undertaking. What I'm most concerned about, which I spoke about last time, is always going to be around equity and access and making sure that new technologies don't replicate or make worse past injustices and past inequalities. And also, as we move into a more edutech environment, that everyone has equal access and capability to, to be educated this way. There's no point doing this if there's a whole group of students or people that can't access it in the first place. But I see that you've done really well in capturing a lot of those equity issues. So I'm looking really forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to throw over to TJ, who is one of our four presenters. Hello, I'm TJ. Um, and before we started, I just wanted to do an acknowledgement of country. I am a proud Aboriginal woman from Ningan, New South Wales. My mob is Wiradjuri and as a part of my culture, we've been doing a version of acknowledgement of country for many, many decades and, and years. 
Um, and the purpose of it is to acknowledge where you are. So I'd encourage everyone to have a think about whose country you're on today and think about what business we're doing on this country and just showing that respect to the owners of the country, the traditional owners. So I'd like to acknowledge that today I'm here on the land of the Darug people in Parramatta. We're all meeting from different places and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to Aboriginal people, elders, past, present and emerging. Thanks. Um, and now I would like to introduce everyone. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Taylor TJ. I am a postgraduate student at UTS. And I'll pass it on to Walter. Introduce yourself. Um, Walter Jarvis, uh, director of uh, the Masters of Management program at the in the faculty of the, not the faculty, the School of Business um, at UTS. Okay. I'll go ahead. Um, Dr. Camille Dixon Dean, Senior Lecturer of Higher Ed and the Faculty of Science. Elsa? Hi, I'm Elsa Baker. I've just finished my second year of undergraduate architecture at UTS. All right. Now, I think I'm due to pick up. Is that right? <laughs> um, I feel very fortunate to be uh, in a second career, having had 30 years of industry, uh, and then having learned from that, uh, be able to have the opportunity to work in academe, and particularly in the business school. Um, you may all be well aware that uh, Simon sent an invitation to the university and inviting people to participate in this. And uh, I don't know my colleagues feel the same way, but I feel very privileged to be part of it. I want to start uh, with some words that we used in our preamble uh, to try to pick up the, the, the themes that will be fleshed out in the principles. But one of the ways that I want to try to focus our attention for the short period that we got together is to, is to quote from Arunda Toy Roy in her work of power politics. And she there says there, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, Keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes a political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. Now, across the four weeks of this workshop, we've learned uh, that words like accountability have been very much to the fore. And they've, they've emerged very strongly alongside transparency and then with a suite of words that have been expressed as principles, which you'll all recognise that uh, could be so easily housed under a rubric of accountability. When we responded to Simon's invitation, I think we've discovered over the course of these last four weeks that the vast majority of us have participated in pursuing a common question. It wasn't necessarily formulated this way. We've obviously grappled with it and learned about it. But it comes down to something like, how can we help ensure that the governance of UTS is publicly accountable for how we use AI and EdTech. Now, that's a crucial perspective because we have had a lot of discussion about the distinction between accountability and responsibility. I learned many years ago from Dr. Alan Hawke, who was one of the senior public servants, that there is a distinct difference. You can delegate responsibility, he said, but you cannot delegate accountability. And I find that a compelling perspective because that means then that in our preamble, we are able to speak about the role of principles and specifically around the role of the principles as guiding principles, guiding principles. We're not trying to develop universal laws. But in that process of thinking about accountability and transparency, we've also realized that they're aimed at something. And we're, what they're aimed at is a kind of very clear notion of trust. And what comes with the trust when we talk about it at a university level is it's about power and authority to make decisions. Now I'm reminded I'm old enough to uh, recall the work of uh, Billy Bragg, who had a terrific song called No Power Without Accountability. In fact, in my postgrad subject, we have a competition called the BBC. 
It's called the Billy Bragg competition. And we prizes go to the students who build up two more stanzas to what goes with Billy Bragg's song. But no power without accountability is the theme we're drawing on from here. And it is related to trust. And that trust is a public trust about what we do at universities. And we're suggesting to those of you coming through and considering what we've done is, think about what university education is as a public good. And what we're inviting you to do is to join us in this endeavor to see we have a stewardship of public trust. A stewardship that artificial intelligence ed tech will be used to serve public good. What Attila Brooms would call societal well-being, a concept of a legacy not to be reduced to merely efficiency and productivity, as important as those are, but, but education uh, as primacy. Now do Camille, thank you. Or to me, I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. TJ, sorry. Um, no, no worries. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the process that we took to actually get to this point where you have those guiding principles in front of you. So we all came together as quite a, a large representative ish group of UTS. We had a, a mixture of educators, students, different levels of all of these things. And we also had a mixture of some people who had quite a lot of understanding of what was going on. And then also some of us like me, a psychologist who really has no idea um, about any of this stuff. And so what the team did, which was really great, is they really embedded us with this foundational knowledge. So we had quite a lot of learnings and teachings from people in the field, learning about the different ethical considerations, the different, the way that these platforms actually worked and how they could potentially work. And then what we would do is we would get together as a team and we would write or begin to write what we thought were the really important things that we needed to communicate to the university. And with that came these principles that we formed. Um, we began by kind of discussing themes and questions that we all had and things that we needed to consider. And then these got grouped into the guidelines and that you see um, in front of you in that document. And what we then did was we had this very democratic process of writing, reviewing, seeing if we had consensus and if we didn't have consensus, what we would need to address or add in to reach that consensus. And so the principles that you see before you are a reflection of our weeks, actually it's probably more like months of mulling it over, thinking about it, starting from, for a lot of us, zero information to really starting to understand what this is going to, what impact this is going to have. We all had different opinions on how it would impact us. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was quite an enjoyable democratic procedure to be a part of. So I'll pass it off to the, the other two to talk a little bit about what themes emerged and, and parts of the process. I'll jump in next. Um, so in a sense, it feels like this document is really the output of an algorithm. Um, it's a result of, I guess, the input consisting of uh, the thoughts and the beliefs, the perspectives and the expertise and experience of everybody here. Um, I feel very lucky to be included in such a incredibly diverse set of people with various needs and opinions. Um, and whilst we feel like we've collectively expressed the values that are important to us here, there may be gaps that we haven't considered and we've made notes within the document to delegate future decisions where we feel others have greater agency to do so. Um, we've had highly knowledgeable people come to talk to us on this topic and whilst this has come to be a result of course of informed decisions, I think it's equally a set of principles that have come from our innate sense of ethics and justice. And we're all entirely optimistic when it comes to notions of technological progression, um, but with big changes come big responsibility. 
Um, and while these principles have been centered around the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of this process, I think it's imperative that the university steps up and takes accountability for the possible futures and outcomes of implementing this tech. Um, and if there's just one thing to take away from all of this, we want you to know that this doesn't mark the end or a full stop. Um, over this process, I think I speak for most of us saying that we've grown incredibly attached to these principles and being here to see out that the right thing is done. And more than anything, we need you to promise that this has to be a fundamentally ongoing process of review that will continually, you know, continue reflecting the needs and values of all of us as EdTech rapidly evolves. Thank you, Alistair. And um, also speaking on behalf of the students, and now I'm going to speak on behalf of the educators, we stand together with the students on this. It's very important that you understand that um, this combined effort that the, the 20 of us souls put into it, it has to be uniquely addressed for all. It can't be just for one party or the other party. We do understand that the big data, data analytics and everything that's happening to us technologically wise is very seductive. And we do need to progress as an organization as, and we did, we did um, what I didn't mention this part of, we did take the word business out of part of our narratives. We do understand that there is that need to progress. And we do understand that progressions do entice you in a business-like format. But at the same time, we think that it's important that we remember that we, the, the human aspect of it, that data is sans emotion. It doesn't have emotion. It does not get hurt. <laughs> it doesn't have feelings. It does not, um, how should I say? <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just not the kind of being. It's not a being. It doesn't have flesh and it doesn't wound easily. We do. So in your efforts going forward, we ask that you take this into consideration. We've done a lot of work and a lot of thinking here. I come from a highly technological background and I'm aware of what it can do and what it cannot do. And I'm also frightful for the, the, the parts that I know I am not, I'm, I'm not aware of. And I know there are limitations in knowledge going forward as to all of the depths of it. So going forward, we stand with the students, we stand with all populations within the university, as well as society, as to the accountability that UTS holds with us, UTS governance, sorry, holds with us. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Elsa. Um, sadly, we get very, very quiet rounds of applause on Zoom. This group, so you know, was nominated by everyone else to speak. And it just so happened that we ended up with undergrads, postgrads, two educators and people from four different faculties. So it speaks to the diversity of the group. Um, you've done an amazing job. They didn't have much time to prepare um, and they've, I think, done the group justice. 